Uh, thank you, Robert. I, you can keep going on. That would be, that's amazing. Great. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, thanks to everybody. Um, thanks to Robert for the offer of being here and to my fellow fellows for um, creating a very stimulating environment for me. And um, the learning process is amazing. So it's wondrous for me. And thanks to everyone else for taking uh, um, moments out of your day and to, to listen to what I have to say today. So much appreciated. The title of my talk for today is Toward a Dracula Urbanism, Smart City Mania. And you can hear me through this if I walk. Fantastic. OK. So that's the, um, the title. And let's make sure this works. OK, great. So I'm going to start with two quotes. And I think this will put us in the mood for my foray into Dracula and Dracula and cities. Quote number one, Dracula-itis furtively moves among us, not as dreams or legends, but as realities of planetary sprawling growth organizations that seductively extract the essence of others as they propel growth and negotiate the shadows of the ordinary. And that's a quote from my colleague, uh, Elvin Wiley. I'm giving him credit on that. And my second quote is from Bram Stoker, who in 1897 wrote Dracula. And Stoker says this, the blood is the life, which is much more concise and curt. Um, and with that in mind, um, let me say this. Uh, my thoughts have wandered in recent days and weeks and, um, dare I say, months, to a relationship. And it is a relationship between, on the one hand, apocalyptic visions and apocalyptic processes. And on the other hand, the currently grim reality of our cities. And when I say cities, I reference cities in the global north, the global south, and if you want to identify the global east and the global west as, as places as well, it is equally applicable. Um, so what's going on in terms of this grimness? I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that cities have become more turbulent and that they've become more tumultuous places. And cities are increasingly beset by things like splintering, a socio-spatial splintering, to the point where it's almost a misnomer to talk about a city. And what may be more appropriate is the idea of a multiplicity of cities, because there's at times so little interconnection between the parts of the city. Um, and the idea of how our cities have become more fractured environments, and our cities have become more socio-spatial polarized, a dramatic increase in polarization. And also, um, I referenced the dramatic ascendancy of gentrification and resident displacing gentrification. And um, there was one time where gentrification was kind of an aberration in urban environments. It was kind of um, something that just appeared and the idea was that it would disappear. It has not disappeared, it has intensified. And in the process now, many cities across the globe actually have centered gentrification as their public policy. This is a time of economic retrenchment. It's an era of neoliberalism. And all of a sudden, gentrification becomes public policy, which we could not have really imagined um, a number of decades ago. So cities are beset by these things. Let me give you some very quick examples. Oh, there it is. OK. That is um, one of my four cities that I'm studying um, in this campus project. And that is um, Flint, Michigan. Flint is truly a multiplicity of cities within cities. So just to give you a, a taste of, of Flint, in 1975, Flint had 86,000 employees of General Motors, of GM. At this moment, that number is down to under 500. 
So it gives you a sense of the trauma that exists in urban environments and the turbulence that is present as well. Another city I'm studying, let's hope this works. Aha, I'll master it yet. Another city I'm studying is Jakarta, Indonesia. And um, actually, I'll be talking a bit about Jakarta today as my foci, trying to chronicle some points. Um, like Flint, Jakarta is truly a multiplicity of cities within a city. Um, it is a perversely fascinating city. Um, just to give you a flavor of it, um, Jakarta, uh, is now flooding to a point where it's going into the ocean, actually the Jakarta Bay. And going into the Jakarta Bay, it's sinking eight to nine to 10 inches per year. I can invoke inches, can I, in Europe? That's fine. You know what I mean. It's going down slowly. And um, in that process, um, the president of Indonesia has actually moved the capital out of, this, out of the city and moved it to East Kalimantan on the island of Borneo. Um, and so you would have thought that real estate capital, that is real estate interest, builders, developers, prominent realtors, would also abandon Jakarta. It has not happened. In fact, real estate markets have heated up in Jakarta and heated up to a point where there's elaborate gentrification. The ingenuity and the perverse ingenuity of real estate interests and real estate capital. So, um, with that in mind, my brief presentation today, what I seek to do is to take a number of small steps forward. And taking some steps forward, I want to advance a thesis. So I'm being pretty precise here, <laughs> rather than speculative at this point. Um, and the thesis I want to advance is that apocalyptic visions and apocalyptic processes are actually crucial to guiding the current construction of many cities. The apocalypse as an imagining, as something unfolding as, as a set of especially political processes, needs to be considered when we think about um, city building, cities being crafted by human beings. And um, what I really want to document today is this idea of Dracula urbanism. And I want to suggest that Dracula urbanism as an advancing phenomenon actually embeds this kind of apocalyptic aesthetic. And one more thing I want to chronicle, that the leading edge of this, that is the leading edge of Dracula urbanism and these apocalyptic influences, is something that we call smart city building. So smart city building today is the rage all over the place. Um, Heidelberg now has declared itself a smart city. And at last count, there was over 350 cities across the globe that have declared themselves smart. And it's the idea of sciencing up and making use of technology and in the process of, of adding those ingredients to make the city more efficient, more effective, and to enhance real estate markets. So um, that's what I'm going to chronicle for you. <laughs> um, now, very quickly, the, the apocalyptic factor here that embeds in Dracula urbanism and smart city building, I want to suggest that the apocalyptic phenomenon has two major influences. One is a belief, and the other is actually a political trope. So the belief is that there are many builders and developers and estate agents and political operatives in cities. And they truly believe that the best days of the city are behind them. That in fact, cities have reached a point due to things like hordes of immigrants and um, decline from the austerity realities of cities and other factors as well that in fact, um, there's kind of the end of history. I'm not trying to sound like Fukuyama here, but it's sort of the end of history 
of cities as we've known them as civilizing places. So that is a belief. And that is an elaborate rationale for using smart city building. Now, the second influence here is the idea of the apocalypse as a trope, as a play. And my idea is that um, there are many builders and developers and city councilors and, and people of power in our cities who don't believe that the end of the city as a place of civilization is around the corner, is at hand. But they also recognize that tremendous political mileage can be gained by invoking the idea of a kind of apocalyptic aesthetic. You know, to talk about the death and the dying of the city, there's very much a, um, a politically expediency to that invoking. So, that said, that's what I want to do today. <laughs> that's what I want to talk about. So quickly, my project for today. I want to ask the question and give some response to it about what Dracula urbanism looks like. And I'm especially interested in how it is organized and arranged. And also what forces and circumstances are guiding it. For example, the guiding influence of the apocalyptic aesthetic. And I'm currently studying governances. I'm going to call them real estate states. Sam Stein's concept of how real estate interests are dynamically merging with governances to create real estate states. And my CAPIS project is looking at Flint and Jakarta and Miami and Mexico City. And today I'm going to talk just about Jakarta. Um, so I'll present preliminary findings on Jakarta. Now there's a final introductory point here. And my final introductory point is that this is very much a work in progress. There is a lot of visitation of sites that is yet to be done, and a lot of conceptualizing and refining and honing. So I'm sort of throwing this out like a Rorschach to you. That's what I'm doing. And um, the presentation, therefore, can be seen as akin to a provocation as much as anything else. Now, I'm going to look at my watch quickly because I'm going to stay on time. I'm going to stay on task. And I'm not going to go a minute over time. So um, points to remember. Um, city building has a long history. So when we talk about smart city building, it's not anything that's new in the sense of making and restructuring urban environments. Every city that we study has conjunctured and contingent pathways. They're unique, they're distinctive. And in that distinctiveness, many cities follow a kind of set of pathways um, with respect to city building. And therefore, smart city building is one more way to remake cities. Um, I draw inspiration from Neil Smith's work and his idea of revanchist realities. Neil Smith made the point that beginning in the early 2000s, punitiveness and punishment was at the core of, of city building. And I think that's still very prevalent today. And he documents in his best work, um, New York City and Rudy Giuliani. And we know who Rudy Giuliani is, right? He's the number one mayor of, a uh, mayor, number one, um, uh, lawyer of, of Donald Trump. Well, he had a life before that, and he was actually the mayor of New York City. And he was very punitive and very punishing in the kinds of policies he served up. My work suggests that it's still the case today. But Dracula urbanism exists simultaneously with it. It's a development that's more subterranean. It's a development that continues to afflict poor, working class and impoverished populations in cities across the globe. But it does it less overtly. All right, so that therefore um, begs the question, what is smart city building? Here's the notion I like. 
Smart cities have become a metaphor for urban modernity. They promise to deliver scientifically, scientifically engineered cities by harnessing and integrating calculative digitization, economically propulsive new infrastructure, and sustainable redevelopment. Now smart city building has moved squarely into real estate stuff. It's no longer about building physical infrastructure. It's actually spilling over into everyday real estate transactions, and hence the importance of gentrification. That was an elaborate introduction, I think. Um, so my ideas, not an attempt to spoof current real estate actions, suggests a new vital metaphor to capture this formation's complicated operations. I identify Dracula urbanism as a deep-reaching, human-punishing unfolding that co-works in revanchist, persistent times with flagrant forms of human immiseration. In its complexities, I see Dracula urbanism as simultaneously a state of mind, a mode of institutional operation, a vision of people, one gaze onto growth's true needs, and a kind of growth produced. So following my early quotes, I suggest that Dracula-like beliefs and conduct are not dead to time and fiction. It's not confined to a novel. But instead, it powerfully lurks today to build places across the globe. Now, with that in mind, my notion of Dracula urbanism has a clear lineage in urban studies. Urban scholars have developed deft analyses of monstrosity and lurking monsters to understand urban phenomena. Um, narratives of things like Frankenstein urbanism, the idea of Federico Cugarello, zombie neoliberalism, the idea of Jamie Peck, um, urban phantasmagoria, Brandy Summers serves that up for us. Urban ghosts in the undead city, offered to us by Drouse and Roddy. And there are others. And what they do is they shed light on previously undetected urban relations, forces, and urban processes. Most tellingly, Cugarello's Frankenstein urbanism excavates the rise of visionary urban experiments to rebuild cities that unleash neoliberalized, destructive, fitful behemoths. So to me, Dracula urbanism does not root in political conspiracies or subterranean plots. That's not what I'm suggesting. But rather, in the near taken for granted world of deeply believed individual truths. So I'm speaking about individualized deep truths here that constitute this thing. These are the truths that planners and developers and city workers have grown up to know and then been socialized into in a neoliberalized world of daily being job trained, performing work, and simply living. It is the behavioral template, I suggest, that Anna Hala identifies as, I really like this term, the property mind. Here, the culture of property, there's a culture of property, melds with technology obsession, fast policy calculative adherence, and the eliminating of people, spaces, and processes that stand in the way of, quote, property progress. Okay, Jakarta, why do I study it? Why do I talk about it today? I talk about it as a study site for, I think, an important reason. It closely approximates numerous global south cities. Jakarta in the global south and lying on the northwest coast of Java, which is the world's most populous island, bears many characteristics of urban places in this global turf. Rapid population growth, dramatic aerial sprawl, ultra-marketized governances, and massive informal economies. And as I say, as I mentioned, the city is now falling into the ocean and is Abdul Malik Simone's mirror for what 
many glo global south cities are becoming. Okay, Dracula. Dracula himself or itself or whatever. Um, my Dracula urbanist notion draws on the original rendition of this monster. That is Stoker's fictitious vampire and Transylvanian nobleman who spends meaningful time in a crumbling castle in the Carpathian Mountains. A true planetist, Dracula does not belong to any particular place. He's a creature of the world and roots nowhere. He momentarily resides in castles as a global vagabond that nests only in expedient places. And beneath a veneer of aristocratic charm, the Count possesses a concealed and dark soul. Polite, polite cunning, and conniving, Dracula assumes many forms. A respectable scientist, an animal, a technocratic curator of science and history. So my guideposts linking smart city development with Dracula-itis. My first guidepost in this smart city building and entrepreneurial smart city building. Um, the first guidepost is that um, there is an attempt at destroying the ways and character of the supposedly degenerate. There's a marking out of the decrepit and the degenerate and an attempt to eradicate them and that. And those today are culturally toxic new arrivals, culturally fallen poor people, socially, morally anti-civic residents. Those are social constructions. So this hardest of neoliberal edges is the kill back to the city, to greatness logic, whose full ambitions can never be presented in full clarity. At work, I want to suggest, in this is a systematic re-demographizing of the city. Cities like Jakarta use smart city building to privilege, attract, and retain their desired city subjects. Who are they? Gentrifiers, creatives, the upper income. The city is to be theirs, to romp around, to actualize in, to perform their dance of consumption across the city. On the other hand, the poor, that is the racialized, gendered other, have seemingly overstayed their welcome in cities. Smart cities in assertion or insinuation are to be for smart people. That is these with the proper waged work ethic, commitment to civic and community pride, those that can valorize land and help attract new investment to the city. Here's the reasoning. If cities like Jakarta are going to effectively compete in the new hypermobile global economy, this deep logic goes, then their populations must be made smart. And of course, city building, regimes of city building have a long history of killing off people's ways and spaces. This is not absolutely new. And as some urbanists have noted, um, city building has often destroyed as much as created new things. But I want to suggest there's something different here and something distinctive. Smart growth operatives target the dispositions and, cu and cultures of select communities and facilitate their demise, all the while they obscure the malevolent aspects of their programs. That's principle number one. Principle number two, my second guiding principle, connecting Dracula urbanism with smart city building today. Real estate states adopt a self-nourishing strategy that is a bolstering parasitism that provides them the lifeblood of their existence. An elaborate subsisting through the resources of other entities, for example, national and global foundations, public-private partnerships, many of us have heard of public-private partnerships, ensures their survival today. Just as Dracula draws nourishment from socially seducing and sucking the blood of taken-in victims. These real estate states 
depends on their own mode of blood extraction. Real estate states needing money, political capital, and social legitimacy in this era of government retrenchment obtain these via two things. Number one, social seductions. And number two, extractions of resources. And this parasitism is not a luxury or an experimental foray. It reflects real estate's urgent need for nourishment. My third guiding principle. This Dracula-esque real estate state is seen to rely on a key resource to build smart cities. And that key resource is, above all things, decline. Dracula strategically uses decline in two ways. To identify the venomous things in need of change. For example, the genetically defective, culturally inferior stocks of people, socially backward communities, in and around Transylvania, around Transylvania and London. And also, Dracula uses decline to politically seduce subjects. That is, he makes use of the attraction and mystique of Gothic decrepit castles and decrepit landscapes. I want to suggest that real estate states today operate similarly. These entities work through projections of eroded neighborhoods, crumbling districts, boarded up housing, culturally zapped poor people. They're not really zapped. That's how they're made out to be. Looming ghettos and decayed infrastructures to push their smart city building. So what I'm suggesting here is to collapse the traditional binary of growth and decline. Historically, decline has been seen as the end product, the residual outgrowth of, quote, growth. And I'm saying no. What's going on in cities today is that actually decline is being used as a critical resource through which growth can take place. My fourth guiding principle. I place these Dracula-esque real estate states at the heart of what gives these formations their very existence, and that's planetary urbanization. And here I'm drawing on the work of the ideas of Neil Brenner and Christian Schmidt and others. Planetary urbanization, a notion of the world and how its places are made, originated with the musings of French philosopher Henri Lefebvre decades ago in the urban revolution. Lefebvre said that looks from the outside of urban places um, would reveal restless, expanding capitalist urbanization without clear boundaries. His project is to destroy the traditional distinctions and boundaries we make in urban studies. All right, Jakarta. Just enough time for Jakarta. Um, As for a little mood setting. <laughs> Jakarta's smart growth does involve a shadowy, uh, shadowy Dracula-esque city building. It is distinctive. First, prominent developers in the city, and their names are Ag Young Sadeo, Ag Young Patamoro, and Lippo, parasitically attach not to private foundations, but to central public megafunders, such as the national Indonesian government and provincial governments. Development companies feed off these state supports that replenish their assets as investment opportunities arise from Jakarta City, now implementing investor-friendly zoning and a citywide master plan. Parasitism here is both a crucial resource extraction and a continuously reconstituted social relation. Also, these capitals maintain funding ties by selling themselves in a distinctive way. And they sell themselves as key extensions of state interests. As a Sadeo executive noted to me, Indonesian and provincial governments are us and we are them. We situate ourselves to be the expression of their will, what they truly want done in Jakarta. We make sure key government officials see the logic of using us to achieve their objectives. There's the seduction, the sense of doing one's bidding. 
Another Dracula-esque belief guides this real estate state's actions, and that is city rebirth purportedly requires death and destruction of human ways. Developers in Jakarta thus widely present Jakarta's smart transformation, smart city building, as, quote, spiritual redoing, quote, a reawakening, and, quote, a renaissance and a revival. But there's something being masked here, I want to suggest. And what's being masked from this is the death of human modes of living, material bases of people, and people's life paths. And at a deep level, this is believed to be a must. Apocalyptic visions of city death mark the consciousness of many of Jakarta's builders and developers. So the apocalyptic aesthetic is clearly here. Thus, the present sprawling Jakarta contains to one developer that I talked to, vast areas of impurity and decay that must be supplanted and replaced. And his dilemma, the developer's dilemma, of constantly moving and roaming presences of poor people, bad culture, degeneracy, blight, are his threats to the city's social fabric. What is the fear? The fear is the death of cities, the end of civilized urban history as Jakarta once supposedly flourished. So, um, a modern day version of Dracula's degeneracy crisis is imagined, and not as expediently reinvented antagonisms, but as deep beliefs um, in the habitas of key decision makers about Jakarta's core. At the same time, other key, key real estate decision makers do something else. And again, here's the apocalyptic factor here. They deploy a kind of apocalyptic trope. Tremendous political capital can be amassed through this invocation. Not truly believing that Jakarta is at a cultural or economic crossroads. You know, they're staring at the possible death of the city. Peddling this kind of fear redevelopment meets their needs. What's being served up here? A grim reality. A city staring at death at the hands of hordes of especially ethnic Chinese in Jakarta and Shia in Jakarta, two marginalized subpopulations. And this supposed reality ominously um, hovers to fracture and really destroy Jakarta. So a political opportunity structure forged out of calculative expediency guides the day. And one developer I talked to had a really intriguing quote. He said to me, yeah, there's lots of doom and gloom associated with making Jakarta smart. It's just part of the sales process. He admits it. Do many people take it seriously? I suppose so, but it's their choice. So in 2019, as illustration, more than 8,000 and 11,000 Asungs were pushed into the streets of the city to sink or die from targeted growth and targeted growth in one region of the city. Loss of homes, social spaces, social networks, grounding residential environments, everyday life paths, and rituals of common conduct left thousands of people in the city destroyed and afflicted. They lost their homes, their neighborhoods, they lost their activity spaces, and many of them lost their capacity to be sheer physical presences in the city. The real estate state of Jakarta did nothing, and it said nothing, with not even any coded language or new vocabulary communicating the sense of an unfortunate reality to the public. Now, what about the decenteredness of this governance? Jakarta's urbanizing, much like Dracula's planetized operations, is a splattered, messy extension spanning the earth. Most obviously, mega developers like Ayung Patamoro 
and he's the self-proclaimed master of super block housing construction in the city. They create smart growth's leading edge, bold and influential buildings that are bolstered by rooting in a key thing, a global circuit of culture. So tapping a global circuit of culture enables the smart city building project to proceed and to proceed with supposed style. With Indonesian president Jodo Widodo easing restrictions on foreign, pro on foreign property investment and ownership in 2015, new growth projects have become more prevalent, artsy, and city shaping. Thus, Podmore, Pod, Podomaro's latest projects are typically guided by global north-based architects, for example, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, guided by engineers, global engineers, for example, Boscalis and Van Ord, and their projects now widely embed what Pierre de Say describes as globally infected smorgasbords of tastes and styles. So they're playful geometric forms, dignified exteriors, mosque and church stylings, kuta and moog towers, and mock European-styled gated communities. An important planetary influence that marks this smart city building. Globalization forges the mindset and actions of key urban builders. So imagine a key builder, developer, city politician in Jakarta and they embrace neoliberal values and neoliberal sensibilities. Where do they get that from? They get that from a pathway of work where they become trained and indoctrinated into the supposed normalcy of these things. So Patamoro's commissioner named Nagasarin daily works through his base of understandings to perform his job, which is shaped by a powerful reality an individual's past, past and present immersion in globalized work settings. A person's current global crat sensibilities, I made up that word, I like it, global crat sensibilities, um, which is belief in market disciplining, austerity, uh, presenting himself as a fighter of um, neoliberal values and those sorts of things, reflects values acquired from previous occupations. And he was the secretary of a prominent bank in Indonesia, general secretary of Umam National in Indonesia, manager at PT Bank, and director of Asian Finance, an Asian Finance Corporation. All of these positionings elaborately tutored him to become a kind of aggressive planetary neoliberal. And finally, of course, this is perhaps unsurprising, um, Patamoro's capital becomes secured through a final planetary involvement, and that's massive investing in international conglomerates. So think of the global connections, the in essence, the food chain of how current capital being spent on the city becomes an end product of this chain of social and economic relationships, which really begins with, very often, the extraction of surplus from miners in third world environments. That's globalization coming home to a place like Jakarta. All right. I'm gonna to conclude to keep on time. This project is just a beginning. And I've imposed in my narration of Dracula-like city building, very quickly, that needs brief identification. So I've imposed silences. Um, for example, resistance on the ground has not been reported on. Resistance is there, it's prevalent, it's active. I haven't yet incorporated into the sensibilities of my thinking. And it's very possible that there's a mutually constitutive relation between those two. So that's an important phenomenon, which I haven't talked about. Um, silences I've also imposed on 
tension, tensions and fissures within the guiding real estate state. I don't think this should be seen as a monolithic phenomenon. There are contradictions that ultimately need to be unearthed to understand this reality. There's also AI, artificial intelligence, I haven't talked about. Um, AI is increasingly being used in Jakarta. There's a long narrative, I can give you about that. But AI is being increasingly used to smarten up the city. And that needs to be excavated as well. Um, yet, in my very brief conversation with you, I've been able to reveal something I think that is potentially important. Um, I've chronicled how a current urban growth governance in Jakarta, fueled by apocalyptic visions and processes, builds smart cities in a way that urbanists have been slow to recognize, and that is as a Dracula urbanist process. Smart city building as a planetary process, like Dracula, seeks to purify a deeply socially contaminated world in belief, in deep belief. Interventions strive to eradicate the ways of the supposedly culturally degenerate. Decline and decrepitness are key project sustaining resources, and these things nourish itself through a parasitic attaching to key hosts in this day and age. I conclude with a final point that current urbanism and its guiding real estate states across the globe are more complicated and deeper reaching than we've realized. Gripped by Dracula-itis, another word I just invented, and its apocalyptic underpinnings, these entities wield power that is parasitically obtained, connected to shadowy desires to eradicate a sense of profound degeneracy, shrouded in mystifying tropes, and rooted in deployments of decline. Their realities, how these governances work and how smart city building proceeds, they are ultimately anything but easily grasped and explained, and bearing only superficial similarities to recent notions that urbanization is propelled by the likes of stumbling zombie-like formations or klutzy Godzillas. Um, I see instead improvisational entities that deftly mask their thinking and planning. And to me, the cultural politics of in-your-face revanchism that we talked about before, Neil Smith's idea um, that he helped us to see is still very much present in cities like Flint and Jakarta. But it's now being accompanied by a state politics that is deep-reaching, immensely adaptive, and spatially elusive. Smart growth Dracula urbanism today lurks as a political economy that is both dark and humanly destructive. And with the 10 seconds I have left, do keep in mind that I've been talking about one subtype of uh, smart city building. One that um, I will label entrepreneurial smart city building. Um, and increasingly, this is becoming the norm. It is dominating other kinds of smart city building as it grows and dare I say, as it festers. I'm on time. I'll stop.